Uh, yes, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Nora. I work at uh, Vips Mobile Pay, and uh, a shout out to some of my coworkers are <laughs> here today. So the systems that I'm talking about today, it was really a team effort maintaining them and making them. So there are a lot of people involved in these processes. And uh, today I'm going to talk about beyond safety, how security can enhance developer experience. And uh, I work as a developer myself and uh, work on developing authentication systems in VIPS Mobile Pay. Uh, so these systems obviously have quite high security requirements because you use them to authenticate and send money and so on. Uh, so I'm really interested in the intersection between development and security. And uh, I know people here have uh, a bit different backgrounds and work with different things. So, uh, but if any of you have been to any security conferences, you might have heard about this like kind of beef that sometimes happens between developers and security professionals. Yes, it's very fun and can get a bit dramatic. So I have some examples here. Uh, so what sometimes can happen is that because security teams, they work outside of development teams, uh, developers might feel like, oh, they maybe come with uh, requirements or lists of problems that might be less or more relevant. And developers are often measured on like how many features they can produce. So security teams might sometimes feel like, oh, the developers are not uh, fixing the security problems quick enough. And we see some examples of this in the open source community. So before summer, this article came out where the developer of a popular open source package called IP he got really upset because he got a CVE registered to his repository. Uh, CVE stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures. So basically, uh, some security researchers found a security problem with his package. Uh, but he was saying that what they found wasn't really so relevant because basically what they were saying was that uh, his package wrongfully identified if an IP was public or private and uh, they rated the CVE as like 9.8 critical. So it was rated quite highly, and he said this was not quite fair. And if you want to read more about this, there is also an interesting article written by Daniel Stanbad, one of the maintainers of Curl. So he wrote about that he also thinks the CVE system is a bit broken because Curl got a CVE registered to it, also rated 9.8 critical. And what this CVE basically was saying was that if you abuse an integer overflow in Curl, then you can make Curl retry a bit quicker than it actually should have retried on a failed request. So again, uh, Daniel was saying this is a bug for sure, but is it like a 9.8 critical CVE? Probably not. Uh, so uh, what I want to talk about today is to show that actually security and development, they can enhance each other and have obviously many things uh, in common. And I want to show some examples where I think that security enables developers and also show an example of how you can implement security features while still keeping a system quite quick and responsive so that security doesn't need to just make the system worse. And uh, I'm going to mention two examples today because we have a bit short time. So I'm going to talk about JSON Web Tokens and how I think they can enhance developer experience in addition to be used for authentication. And then I'm going to talk about async first, which is a way in which we use to implement a security feature in a way that doesn't slow down a system and make it worse to use for users. Yes, so let's start with the JSON Web Token example. So I'm going to give the world's quickest, quickest intro to API security. Uh, so basically, if you have an API that you are hosting somewhere, uh, then if you put no authentication on your API, then you basically have a URL that anyone in the world can go to and get data back from the API. Uh, so sometimes you want to add security to this and require that someone authenticates themselves in order to get data back. And you can add this security on different levels. You could just require someone to send the username and password, for example, to get the resources from the API. Uh, but one thing that is quite common to do is to require someone to send a JSON web token to be able to authenticate to the API. So some of you might have seen in DevTools that sometimes you send an authorization header where it says bearer, and then you have this uh, long uh, gibberish value, which is the token that you're sending to authenticate towards the API. And don't worry, this is not a real token from uh, Vips Mobile Pay. This is just uh, it's a random image I found on, <laughs> on Stack Overflow. 
Uh, so yes, uh, the JSON web tokens, they look something like this. So this is an encoded token to the left here. And uh, this token might look like very secure because it looks so gibberish and strange to understand, but actually it's just base64 encoded and anyone can decode it to get these values to the right, which is the payload inside of the token. Uh, so the most important thing to know for this presentation is that these tokens, they are cryptographically signed. And this means that nobody can change this information that you see to the right here inside the token without ruining the whole signature. So it's a security mechanism that ensures that the data you see to the right here hasn't been tampered with when it gets to your backend system. And uh, in BIPs Mobile Pay, we have a system that hands out these tokens. Uh, so this is one of the systems that my team is maintaining. It's called Vinx. And the name Vinx, it comes from combining the word Sphinx with a V for VIPs. And the reason for this is because the Sphinx was like uh, a protector of pyramids in Egyptian methodology. And our system Vinx is like the protector of all APIs in VIPs Mobile Pay. So you can't do anything in the app or call any other API without having uh, a Vinx token to do other things in the app. So Vinx is the authentication system that hands out these tokens. And if you have logged into the Vips app, you might have seen like three dots on the screen when you scan your face ID, for example. And behind those three dots, it's Vinx working, checking if you are who you say you are. And if uh, you manage to authenticate, you get a token. And the way this works is that, okay, like we said, a user logs in, they authenticate, Vinx sends them an access token, and then the user and the app, they can do other stuff in VIPs Mobile Pay as long as they send this token to the other APIs. And uh, so JSON Web Tokens are used for authentication, but I also think they have some advantages for developers that go beyond just the authentication part. Uh, so one of these is that there is useful data stored in the token, and using tokens also allows you to do offline validation. Uh, let me explain this a bit further. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned in the token slide where we show the encoded and decoded token, uh, tokens have payload and data inside of them that you can guarantee to be uh, correct and not tampered with as long as the signature pans out. Uh, so, uh, to the right here, you see uh, an example of a test token in VIPs Mobile Pay, and you have some data here. So, these words might look a bit strange, but for example, you have MSISDN, which basically means phone number, where you can see the phone number of a user. Uh, you can see that they have uh, different ID values, which says what kind of authentications they have used, uh, and so on. So you have some information about the user inside of this token. And what this means is that if I'm a developer making a new system in VIPs Mobile Pay, so I'm going to make a completely new system, and I need some of this data, then I don't have to make a call to other systems to get this data. But if I need to use tokens anyway, then I can just fetch these values from the tokens themselves. And uh, our system, Vinx, the authentication system, hands out these tokens. But these tokens have a lot of values that don't just have to do with authentication. For example, the phone number value. So we could ask ourselves, well, if Vinx is going to give these tokens with this information, how does Vinx know what this information is? Uh, how, how does it fill the information inside the token? So what we do is, I'm going to show an example here. Uh, so here to the left, you have an OTP system. OTP stands for one-time PIN, and it is a system that sends out an SMS that a user uses to verify their phone. And to the right here, you have Vinx, the authentication system. Uh, so the way this works is that uh, when a user has successfully verified that they own their phone, maybe some of you remember when you register to Vips Mobile Pay, you actually get an SMS where you have to fill in the value to make an account and prove that you have access to your device. So this is the OTP system. So the OTP system is the one doing this work. And when a user has managed to prove that they own their device, the OTP system, it sends a call to Vinx and says, OK, a user has managed to prove that they own their phone. And Vinx says, OK then I can add that value to the token. 
And the reason why we can trust this call from the OTP system is that this is a backend to backend call protected with Azure Entra authentication. So this is a way of making a secure channel, uh, a backend to backend channel. Uh, where you can trust that if someone has been authenticated via Entra and has this role, then they can be allowed to set these values on the token. And uh, I'm going to go just check time quickly. Okay, I'm going to try to hurry up. <laughs> so uh, JSON Web Tokens, they also allow you to do offline va validation, which means you don't need to make additional calls between systems. So let's look at an example here. So here to the left, we have the app. We have the OTP system again, the one-time PIN system that sends out SMS messages. And then we have a user registration system to the right, which is used to keep track of all the activities that the user has to go through to make an account. And if you use uh, a JSON Web Token approach here, then you can make a design like this. So a user has managed to prove that they own their device. And the OTP system says OK and sends a token to the app. Then the app can send this token to the user authentication system. And the user authentication system can just verify the token. It doesn't need to make any additional calls to check that this user has actually proven that they own their device. An alternative approach, if you were not using JSON Web Tokens, would be to make something like this. Uh, so this time, a user still manages to input the values from the SMS correctly, but they don't get the JSON Web Token from the OTP system. Instead, they get an authorization code, which is just like a value. And then when the app sends this authorization code to the user authentication, user registration system, the user registration system can't just trust it. It needs to make an additional call back to OTP and ask, is this code really something you handed out? And then wait for a response back before moving on. So you have an additional online call in this part of the system here. And I think as a developer, if you need to work with authentication and validate tokens anyways, then they can simplify life for you in a way where you don't need to make these additional calls to other systems. And then I'm quickly going to talk about <laughs> async first, which is a way in which implement we implemented a security feature without slowing down Winx too much. Uh, because like I previously said, Winx is the authentication system that everyone needs to go through to do anything else. So it needs to be quite quick. It can't be like a very slow login system. And if something happens where Winx is down, then nothing works in the VIPs app. Uh, but still, we can't just allow anyone to log in. So we also have a blocking system, which is supposed to block users, and we shouldn't log in users that are not allowed to log in. And uh, what you can do, so if you had an authentication system and I had to implement this blocking feature, how would you do this without disturbing the authentication system too much? Uh, so one way in which you could do it is in a synchronous way. So here we have the app, we have the authentication system, and we have the blocking system. And if you do things synchronously, then a user asks to log in. The authentication system needs to then ask the blocking system for every request, uh, is it okay that this user logs in? And get and wait for a response back. And now this can cause some problems in very high traffic systems, because what you're doing now is that you're creating a dependency between the authentication system and the blocking system. So if the blocking system is down, the authentication system uh, doesn't work. And another problem is that you have some extra time making this additional call to the blocking system, even though in reality this is not, not a very long time. Uh, but an alternative async first way of implementing this is that, OK, here we still have the app. We have the authentication system. We have the blocking system to the right here. But now we have also introduced a worker. And a worker, this is a system that just keeps working all the time in between. So this worker, it's always asking the blocking system, do we have any blocked users? And then the blocking system will respond with, yes, OK, this person is blocked. And then the worker will directly update the database of the authentication system. And what this means is that when someone logs in, instead of making 
an extra call to the blocking system every time, the login system can just check inside of its own database if this user is blocked or not and get a quick response back. So this is a way of decoupling the authentication system from the blocking system. And I thought this was a, a fun example of how you can implement uh, a security feature such as blocking users in a way which doesn't slow down the system or couple the system so tightly together that it can cause problems. Uh, so my key takeaways here is that uh, what I've seen with JSON Web Tokens and these type of things is that I think they can actually help developers in the long run to architecture simpler systems to use. And it is possible to have systems that are quick, uh, but also adhere to security requirements and implement security features. And I also think that Actually, when you have some limitations on a system, when you have some requirements such as security requirements, it can be a positive thing because um, what you have to do then is to automate more and come up with better architectures to meet all of these requirements. And I think that can kind of lead to more efficient system and more innovation that comes from these limitations instead of just slowing it down and making everything uh, awful to use. Thank you so much. This was everything for me. Thank you.